Right, Matrix. Um, we've looked now at speciation and um, according to the guidelines, um, you need to be able to explain speciation um, through geographic isolation in any one of the following, either the Galapagos finches, Galapagos tortoises, plants on different land masses, um, or any other example of mammals on different land masses. And so you'll find this um, from page 290 to 294. Effectively, we can look at any one of them, um, and you don't need to know all of them off by heart. Essentially, you just need to know one of them. Um, but at the same time, in the final exam, they could use any animal. Um, they've used camels before, they've used lizards. Um, so you need to be prepared for any um, example that might come up. I'm just going to quickly look at something, um, uh, one of the examples from the textbook, which is the uh, speciation of proteas on um, different continents. So um, effectively, what I'm looking at here is speciation due to geographical isolation. And it's a situation where a species becomes separated by a physical barrier, like a lake and mountain, and it diverges along a separate evolutionary path. And so an example that we are looking at in the photographs above are the protea family. And protea pollen has been found fossilized in Antarctica, but there are also living examples that are found in South Africa and Australia. And the picture on the left are protea flowers that are found here in South Africa, and the ones on the right are ones located in Australia. And you can see uh, there are a lot of similarities um, within them, but they are uh, phenotypically different, and there's a possibility that they're also genotypically different, which would mean that they are different species. Now, why do we need to know this? Um, well, effectively, it tells us that proteas evolved when all of the continents were still joined together, and then when they drifted apart, that then separated them. In other words, the main protea family um, would have evolved all together at the same time because they look far too similar to have evolved separately for um, hundreds of millions of years. Rather, they evolved up until a point, and then uh, when the land masses broke apart, they did follow their own evolutionary pathways, um, but there were very little changes that occurred, um, even though perhaps the geographical location changed, the temperature changed, and other factors changed. Now, this is just a visual representation of exactly what I'm talking about in terms of um, geographical isolation, which is what leads to speciation. And effectively, that is when one species evolves into another, and that is known as macroevolution, which we mentioned in a much earlier lesson, um, and that's where you have a new species. Remember, microevolution is where you change um, a less important, let's call it, um, characteristic that doesn't uh, create a new species, and that might just be something like a color becoming more favorable than another color. That doesn't mean that you are a different species. It just means that one color is maybe more favorable to suit the environment at the time. And remember that macroevolution happens at a species level. In other words, it's not necessarily happening um, at a um, genus level. Another example that is in the textbook that maybe if you'd like to go through as well, remember you only need to know one of them um, about geographic isolation, is the Galapagos finches. And so a quick uh, short story attached with them is that the Galapagos finches would have all started on the mainland of South America. They would have blown onto the nearby Galapagos Islands, which are I think about a cluster of around several or more islands. Each island is um, environmentally different. One is almost a volcanic um, island, very little vegetation. Another one is covered in cactuses, um, desert-like. And so effectively what would have happened is each one of those finches um, would have gone through natural selection and it would have resulted in microevolution at first. 
but eventually those finches would have accumulated enough changes phenotypically and genotypically to create um, a new finch species and as you can see here all the finches that you see on the screen now would have originated from the original parent group from the mainland. Each one of them has a physical favorable characteristic that suits their environment and uh, in this case um, the physical um, characteristic that was so important to our finches was their ability to feed and so you'll notice that this diagram speaks about their bill shape or their beak shape and it refers to what they eat fruit insects cactus and seed eaters and so basically what that means is these finches were put under environmental pressure and they either had to evolve um, or they would die now remember they can't choose to evolve instead there was the variation in the beak size and perhaps those um, finches that generally ate seeds Perhaps um, a few of them, their beaks were slightly shorter and narrower, which may have allowed them to start eating insects as well as seeds. And um, over a period of time, there could have been a um, point of evolution where their, their beaks um, collectively started to change. And this is a, a great example of punctuated equilibrium as well, in that this may have taken... Um, as little as 50,000 years for it to occur. So now we have two or more species and there is a multitude of reasons why these species can't interbreed with one another and so we call these mechanisms for reproductive isolation. And the first reason why um, two different species cannot interbreed with one another is that they may breed at different times of the year. So it says that two species that perhaps show hibernation, which is sleeping during the day, and estivation, um, which is a slow metabolism in summer heat, they would never have a chance to mate. In other words, they breed at different times of the year, they're more active maybe in summer months, whereas others are more active in the winter months. Also, organisms that have different behaviors like hibernation, being nocturnal or diurnal, would have effect, uh, an effect on their reproductive behaviors. In other words, if you're a nocturnal animal, you are never going to interact with organisms that are diurnal and therefore that reproductively isolates you. Now, these are also known as temporal isolation um, factors, and that is based on the time of the year. Now, some organisms also breed at different times of year, so perhaps it's nothing to do with the fact that you are awake at night or awake during the day. Rather, maybe you breed in the summer months, whereas um, another species breeds in the autumn. And if your um, fertility um, does not overlap uh, within a species, then you won't be able to breed with one another. In other words, if the female part of the population is not fertile during that time of the year, you wouldn't be able to breed with them. And so what this does is it creates um, a barrier um, and it doesn't allow for interbreeding. And this is also known as prezygotic um, reproductive isolation. In other words, um, preventing any zygote from being formed because no reproduction can take place at all. Now, the second reason why species may not be able to reproduce with one another is that they may not have the same courtship behavior. And many animals have specific courtship rituals that impress females. And so that means if you don't know the specific uh, courtship ritual, you won't be able to find and attract a mate. An example of this would be certain spiders perform a dance before mating with female with the female of the species. And if you were a male spe spider of another species, you wouldn't be able to use the same courtship behavior to attract the female of the same species. So, so basically, she wouldn't be able to recognize your courtship behavior. You wouldn't be seen as a possible mate to her. Likewise, um, with uh, birds of paradise. Um, 
there is a video I will attach that you can have a look at. And they are the birds um, found, um, I think it's in Papua New Guinea. And they uh, have brightly colored uh, plumage, the males, and they do these dances that are species specific. And so if you don't know the dance, you won't be able to impress any females. Now, the third possible reproductive isolation mechanism in plants would be how plants are adapted for different pollinators. And that might be because they must be pollinated by a specific pollinator due to their structure, and they rely on their pollinator's specific diet to ensure pollination takes place. For example, the boabab tree and the fruit bat. This is an exclusive and mutual relationship and the boabab tree doesn't attract other pollinators. And the reason for that is the boabab tree flowers open at night, which means it attracts nocturnal animals. And there are many other plant adaptations like perhaps wind pollination um, or insect pollination, bird, and that then leads to things like different colors and shapes of flowers, the position of the flower, and it all basically leads to the pollinator and at what time of the day the pollinator comes out and what is the diet of the pollinator. The fourth um, reproductive isolation mechanism is prevention of fertilization and this is also known as mechanical isolation. This one's fairly straightforward. It basically means that the um, reproductive organs don't fit with one another and that basically leads to mating pairs not being able to reproduce if their genitals are not compatible. This is also seen in plants as well. Now the fifth possible um, reproductive mechanism is infertile offspring in a cross species hybrid. Now that sounds like quite a mouthful to describe because the whole way through we've said, well, if you're not the same species, you can't interbreed and therefore make fertile offspring. Well, there's sort of a exception to the rule, um, and that might be seen in organisms that are very similar to one another, um, and they can reproduce once, but then all the offspring after that are fertile. Examples of this would be a lion and a tiger producing a liger. Um, that's possible, but the liger isn't fertile. Likewise, with a donkey and a horse can make a mule, but then that mule is infertile. And so this is when two different species reproduce with one another, and there are three possible outcomes. Now, you don't need to know all of these in detail. This is just to round off the knowledge, um, but you get reduced hybrid uh, viability, which means the embryo is aborted. And this would happen if two species mated with one another and they were genotypically very different, the embryo would never actually implant. The second option is reduced hybrid fertility, meaning that offspring is born, but it's infertile, for example, like our liger. Or the third is hybrid breakdown, which means it produces offspring and that first generation is fertile. However, every generation after that is infertile. Now, the very last uh, section um, for this lesson is on evolution in present times. And this is on page 297 to page 300, and it covers insecticides, antibiotics, and antiretrovirals. So according to your um, guideline, you also need to know any one example of these. And so I'm not going to go through all of them to save time, um, but also to make it a little bit easier for you to go through one of the three um, that are present. And effectively, what you need to make note on any one of these, or you can read through all of them, is how is evolution taking place today? Um, I have seen in papers um, the insecticide and the antibiotic example come up a lot, and that might be because they like to overlap um, it with um, uh, human impact on the environment with insecticides, um, and they also like to overlap antibiotics and how um, 
the changes and the mutations in, in bacteria, they like to link that to um, uh, genetics and how um, genetic engineering occurs. So you can see how they like to overlap two topics, um, genetics and evolution and human impact and evolution. So I would suggest going through one of these um, and making a note on how this specific example represents evolution now. What is the, what is the mechanism that's taking place? So what's the, the natural selection mechanism? What's selecting what is favorable? And what ultimately um, is then producing a new form or a new species at the end?